As Christians, we're very familiar with the story of Jesus' birth. Every year we hear how he was born of a virgin. And if your family's like mine, you may even read that story from scripture every Christmas morning. The danger with being really familiar with a passage of scripture or a story like that is that it can lose its wonder. Today, when it comes to Christmas, we don't want to miss it. We never want to get satisfied in our walk with Jesus. Tells us that he had become content in all things, right? He'd become content in all things. No matter whether he has it or whether he doesn't, he has just become content. And I think that's a good thing for us to be. But the Bible also tells us that we should grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And growing is about forward momentum. It's about moving. It's about maturing. So you can't get content with where you are, right? You can't stay content there. You need to be moving forward and be growing in that direction. Think about something like rest or Sabbath, right? The Bible encourages us to take this time to, to draw away and to rest and to recharge. In the Old Testament, you see that idea of Sabbath, that concept of Sabbath, where we are still and we know that he is God. But at the same time, 1 Corinthians 15 tells us that we should be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. We are to pray without ceasing. And there's these kind of things, right? Where we, we are to rest and recharge while at the same time we never stop serving and, and working in that idea. And satisfied is that way, right? You and I should be satisfied with Jesus. Remember the Gaither vocal band, Bill Gaither, they sang that song, I'm satisfied with Jesus, right? Said he would be my comfort, said he would be my guide, and he, we're satisfied in him. Since the day that he has changed our soul, changed our life, we are satisfied in him. And while we should be satisfied with Jesus, we should never be satisfied in our walk with him. This is the idea. We can get satisfied with what we know about Christmas, we can say, well, I know that it's not about the lights and I know it's not about Santa Claus and I know it's not about the presents and it's not about, we can go through the whole list, right? I know it's about Jesus. And even though we know that fact, it can become routine and rote and habit. And when we look to the passage of scripture that we're gonna read today, we're gonna focus on the religious leaders. The religious leaders will miss Christmas because they are satisfied with what they know. They have an idea of who the Messiah will be. They have studied the prophecies. They have an idea. They think they have a grasp. They don't think that they need to learn anything from these wise men. But when the Messiah actually shows up, they miss him. And they miss him because they're satisfied. They're stuck with what they know. And the thing about the Christmas story is, is that because we read this like the, the verses we're going to read and, and uh, some of these verses we, we read in Luke 2. You may read those passages every, every Christmas morning. You may sit down and you may read that together. And the danger in a story being so familiar to us is that it loses its wonder. That's the danger in it. That's what had happened to these guys. They had studied the prophecies and they knew them, yet it all lost its wonder. And when he shows up, they're indifferent to it. They don't care. Let's read the passage together. We're going to read in Matthew chapter 2. We're going to read the first six verses and see how they miss the wonder of Jesus' birth. We read some of these verses last week, but let's refresh ourselves. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who's been born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. 
and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. The wise men have come from the east. They come to Herod. They have questions. Where is the newborn king? Remember the attitude of Herod? King, what king? I'm king, right? But when they have questions of him, Herod needs some additional information, so he reaches out to the religious leaders. He reaches out to the scribes and the, the, the priests, and he brings them in, and he has one main question for them. You see it in verse 4. Where will the Christ be born? Now, we know what's going to happen in this story, and I believe the wheels are already going in Herod's mind. If they say there's a king being born, we don't know where that king's. I'm going to send them, and they're going to tell us, and we're going to go, and we'll kill it. We'll kill that baby, right? That was his, that was his mindset, I believe, from the beginning. And so his question is, where is the baby born? That's his main question. And do you notice that the religious leaders have an answer for him right away, immediately? Where, where are the prophecies? Where does it say that the Messiah will be born? In Bethlehem. And they quote to him, look at verse 6. They quote to him, Micah 5 and 2. They quote verbatim the prophecy to him that explains that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Catch this. The scribes were a group of people who knew the Old Testament forward and backward. They had the whole thing memorized. They would have known it. The scribes, their job was to study the scriptures, expound on the scriptures, and at the same time, the scribes would be the one that would be in charge of recopying any scrolls that were in disrepair. If you had a scroll that they would read in the synagogue or in the temple, and that, that, that scroll became tattered or torn, before it became unreadable, their job was to record all of that. And there was this rigorous process by which they would go through and they would copy. Wayland's shaking his head. We've studied some of that together. They would, they would rigorously go through and make sure that everything was meticulously right. They would have, have copied all that. And not only did they go through this whole process to make sure it was right, but they had the whole Old Testament memorized verbatim in order to... And so when Herod says, where is the Messiah to be born? They're able just to spit it out. They know it like the back of their hand. These scribes, this was at an actual position. You know, a lot of times when we talk about religious leaders, we talk about, say, like Pharisees, for instance, right? Pharisees were more like a were more like a, think about like a political party. Like they were like a, a religious party, right? But they were a faction, a group. And so uh, Pharisees were not necessarily a position. Scribes were a position. And many of the scribes were Pharisees, but not all Pharisees were scribes. Get the idea? So in this whole thing, when, when he asked the question, the point is when Herod asked the question, they know every detail about the prophecies. Yet they still miss Christmas. They miss Christmas. Now, what I want us to do is I want to, I want to look at some reasons why these particular re religious leaders miss Christmas. But I also want to fast forward a time or two in this message. I want us to fast forward 30 years. And I want us to go, to, because I don't believe these were the same religious leaders here that Herod asks that were giving Jesus such a hard time later in the Gospels, right? Some of them may have been the same, but many of them probably were not. But we don't have a name here, right? It's not one person like an innkeeper or a Herod. When we talk about these religious leaders, we're talking about a group of people. And that group of people represents a mindset. And the mindset is what we want to avoid. The fact that we, most of us sitting here, are believers. Most of us have heard the Christmas story over and over and over again, right? Multiple times, right? Take your age, how many ever Christmases you've been alive. Those, the equation is those Christmases uh, plus X, whatever, I don't know. And you get this, this number of times that we have heard the Christmas story. And the danger is we'll be satisfied with it and it'll just be bland information just like it was for these guys. Let's take that mindset and look at it. I want to tell you three things today that will happen 
if you become satisfied, this is why you will miss Christmas. If you get satisfied, that will lead to you, first of all, being indifferent. If you get satisfied, it will lead to indifference. Think about these guys for just a moment. They knew all these prophecies. Here they are at Herod's house. They have been studying these prophecies for a long time about Jesus' birth. They knew all of them. And here's a group of people who are announcing there's a rumor that the Messiah has been born. It's just a few miles down the road. But you know what their reaction was? Eh. They have the answers, but they, they don't spring into action. They, they're very indifferent. Like if you think for just a minute about this for me and you, we love Christmas and we love Christmas for this reason. God became flesh and dwelt among us. Why is it such a big deal? I ask, we talked in this morning in Sunday school with those, with those children in my room about, about um, Christmas and about Jesus being born. And then I asked them, I said, well, listen, there's lots of babies born. Jesus, so what? Why does it matter that Jesus was born? Tell me, the, tell me the reason why it matters that Jesus was born. Because he would die for our sins. That was the answer that Owen gave me. He would die for our sins. You see, you and I sit here having believed and trusted in the gospel. The gospel that says that you and I are sinners apart from him and we have put our faith and trust in him and we have been radically changed. We are very different. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. He has made us alive. We were without help and without hope and now we are set with a future in heaven. We, many of us, could go around the room and describe what happened to us when we came to Christ and we, we would tell of a wonderful, miraculous experience that happened to us. And yet a preacher stands in the pulpit and starts speaking about that very gospel and about repentance and belief and turning from your sins. And we say, hmm, heard that. What else you got? Yeah, I'm not interested in that gospel stuff. What, give me a story or something that's a little more interesting to me because the gospel, I've heard that. We become indifferent to the very thing that has radically made a huge difference in our life. That was these guys. They'd heard the prophecies. They knew all of the stories. They had been looking for the Messiah. And yet the wise men show up and tell him that he's there. And they say, hmm. they're very indifferent. And you know and I know that indifference, apathy, is a real problem. Listen to this news story. Two-year-old Chinese toddler Wang Yu died today following injuries sustained in a hit-and-run accident. Traffic video surveillance cameras show the tiny girl was struck not once but twice by two consecutive vehicles. The cameras also show that more than a dozen people ignored the injured child as she lay bloodied and battered on the street of a busy marketplace in the Guangdong province. They simply walked on by. Wang Yu was eventually tended to by a 50-year... 58-year-old female pedestrian identified as Granny Chen. She was admitted to a local hospital in critical condition, but as reported, she did not survive. The multiple hit and runs and the ensuing lack of compassion on the part of the passerbys has led to an international outcry against what is perceived as the negative societal byproducts of China's rapidly changing society. The incident even resulted in the launching of a Stop Apathy campaign on the Sinawaibu uh, website. This is like a, evidently like a Chinese Twitter, right? Apathy. I could have pulled that news story. I could have pulled those news stories where people are getting mugged or robbed or stabbed and they're crying for help and the lights are coming on and people hear the screams and yet nobody intervenes and nobody helps and that person dies. If you work in a job where it's dangerous and there may be lots of safety or OSHA procedures, you know that if you get apathetic to the dangers, that's when accidents tend to happen, right? This, this idea is, is true in the real world. Like we know that in the life that we're living, right? But when it comes to our spiritual life, we say, well, apathy's no big deal. Mm. But it is. Do you remember in Revelation what what was said to the church at Laodicea? Do you remember? Not interested in you because you're lukewarm. You're not hot. You're not cold. And I just spit you out of my mouth. It was apathy. 
It was this indifference, right, to everything. And so when it comes to our spiritual life, we may say that we have been saved by the glorious gospel, but we begin to shrug off things. Church attendance. I mean, I can still be a Christian, not go to church. I'm good. I'm good. Well, I mean, praying every day, you know, staying in, you know, praying without ceasing. I mean, that seems a little overkill, right? I mean, our David David is such a good pastor, and he thoroughly shares from God's Word. And so I'm sure that if I just sit there on Sunday and I just listen to his message and I really try to pay attention, I'm sure that's all the Bible I need for the week. I'm probably good with God's Word if I just listen to David. We become apathetic, and it seems like no big deal, but it's a big deal. I found this little poem This kind of sums up that idea, right? I looked up a farm one day that once I used to own. The barn had fallen to the ground and the fields were overgrown. The house in which my children grew where we had lived for years, I turned to see it broken down and I had to brush aside the tears. I looked upon my soul one day to find it too had grown with thorns and nettles everywhere the seeds neglect had sown. The years had passed while I had cared for things of lesser worth. The things of heaven I had let go while minding things of earth. To Christ I turned with bitter tears and cried, O Lord, forgive. I have not much time left for thee, not many years to live. The wasted years forever gone, the days I can't recall. But if I could live those days again, I'd make him Lord of all. It's a big deal. And every moment that we spend in apathy in our Christian life is a moment that we're not growing. I love Amy. I love her very much. And I, have, I, I, I cannot foresee, I could not foresee me laying on my deathbed and her sitting there beside me holding my hand and me saying to her, you know what? I wish we'd have spent less days together. I wish wish you just wouldn't have been around so much. You're laughing because it's ridiculous. Because I love her and I'm passionate about her. But yet when it comes to the moments that we spend with him, it's no big deal. It's no big deal. But you see, if, if I'm passionate about him the same way that I'm passionate about her, should be more so, Right? then the moments and the time that I give will matter. And I will not just simply be indifferent to it. I will give myself to him wholeheartedly. You see, the thing about it is, is when we become apathetic, indifferent to small things, we become apathetic and indifferent to big things. And this is what eventually happened to the religious leaders. Look at what it says in John 11. This passage is immediately following Lazarus. Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. Many people have heard of this amazing miracle. And in John 11, 45, it says, Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary, had seen what he did, raising Lazarus from the dead. And they believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what Jesus had done. And so the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered the council and said, What are we to do? For this man performs signs, you know, like the Messiah is supposed to do. This man performs many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him and the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Listen, a few verses down. So from that day on, they made plans to put him to death. You see, when we find them in in Matthew chapter 2, they hear about Jesus' birth and they say, "Eh, no big deal. But when he proves himself out to be the Messiah... They just soon kill him as look at him. They're indifferent about this, about this area, and it leads to them being indifferent to murder before it's over with. Yeah, we're fine just to kill him because he may be the Messiah. Did you hear that passage? He's performing signs, and he may be the Messiah, but if he's the Messiah, we lose our spot, and we better get rid of him. When you become indifferent to one thing and cold to one thing, it only grows. Don't become satisfied. Don't become indifferent in your walk with him. Be passionate about him. He won't spend every moment 
with him. If you're satisfied, it'll lead to indifference. Second thing I would tell you is it'll lead to inaction. It will lead to inaction. When the wise men come, they do uh, they don't travel. It's just a few miles to Bethlehem, but they don't leave Herod's palace and go to where the baby is. And this is interesting to me because it's it's stacked right up against the wise men and their experience. Think about the wise men and what they went through, right? They come from the east, probably modern-day Iraq. Like They make a journey. It cost them money. It was considerable time, effort, energy, and comfort. And yet they travel all of that distance to come and worship the new king. And yet these men who had been studying the prophecies their whole life couldn't be bothered to travel a few miles down the road. It leads to inaction. The same is true for me and you. This is a picture of the inaction that will come to our spiritual lives if we become satisfied. You see, you don't have to do anything wrong to be in the wrong, right? Like you don't necessarily have to do anything. Let me show you this verse. James 4 and verse 17 says this. Whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him, it's sin. So we think about, well, what's sin? And we think about, you know, uh, things that we might do, right? That, those things that we call sins of commission. We commit those sins. We, we murder, we steal, we lie, right? Those sort of ideas. Well, those sins of commission, right? But what James is talking about are the sins of omission. These are the sins that we, it's a thing that God would desire us to do, a thing that God would have us do. We just don't do it. These sins of omission are just as glaring as sins of commission. And that's what happens to these religious leaders. It's not that they do something wrong. They don't do anything. Think for just a minute about some times in Scripture where that's the case. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan, the priest, and the Levite? They don't harm the man who's been injured. You know, they don't kick him while he's down. They just don't do anything to help. They just keep riding. Remember the, the, the ten virgins? Um, and, and you had those five foolish virgins who, who didn't prepare and didn't get ready. It's not that they were evil. They just were inactive. They just didn't do anything. S same, same vein right there in those same chapters. What about the man who buried his talent in the ground? Right? He didn't squander it. He didn't blow it. He came back and gave the master the, the talent back. But it was inaction. He had not invested it as the others had. Do you remember um, at that, uh, those 10 lepers that Jesus healed? And there were nine, there was one that came back to thank Jesus, but there were nine that just went on their way and did their thing, right? Now, at best, they were just caught up in the excitement and just forgot to come back. But at worst, they were ungrateful for what Jesus did. And they didn't come back and thank him. Think for just a minute about that in, in uh, is it Matthew 25 where you have that division of the sheep and the goats, you know. And he, there's those that are to his right and those that are to his left. And do you remember those that are go to his left, those goats that are condemned, it's not because of something they did. It's because of something they didn't do. I was hungry and you didn't feed me. I was naked and you didn't clothe me. I was in prison you didn't visit me. It was things that weren't done, not things that were done, that were the problem. And I would say to you that I believe that for me and you, sins of omission, this inactivity, the inaction that we take is a real problem. We can not pray. We cannot read our Bible. We cannot forgive. We cannot help others. We cannot assemble together for the worship, you know, for the worship of, of our Lord. All of these things are sins of omission, and the fact that we don't do them, we feel like there's not really any problem, right? There's no immediate consequences to that, and so we feel like it's no big deal. But sins of omission, if I had to guess, those things that we don't do as a Christian, those are the things that haunt me more than the things I have done, right? I'm just going to tell you, I mean, there's things that I've done that I'm ashamed of, but when I think about it, really, 
It's the things that I haven't done that I should have done that really get me. See, that idea of, 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 of sins of omission, just inactivity, inaction. Think about it like this. You know how if you go down the road at 100 miles an hour, you get a speeding ticket, right? Unless you're Amy, they give her warnings. They give me speeding tickets, right? But if you go 100 miles an hour down the road, you're breaking the law because you are exceeding the speed limit, right? But when you get on the interstate, there's this sign, right? And it's a minimum speed limit. You, don't, you can't go under this speed limit, right? So in some ways, think about it this way. Sins of commission is going 100 miles an hour on the interstate, right? Sins of omission are going 30 miles an hour on the interstate. And the guy going 30 on the interstate is just as dangerous as the guy going 100, right? And so when we start thinking about it in terms of that, we can realize and recognize that these things are damaging to our spiritual life. Now, if I think about these guys and they're in action and I try to put myself in their shoes and I try to say, what were they thinking? Why would they be right there in Jerusalem, just a few miles away from Bethlehem? Why would they be right there at it, yet the wise men come and tell them that Jesus is there and they don't go? It's because they don't really believe it. They don't believe. You know how I know that? Because in my own life, when I hear a command in Scripture and I just don't do it, it's because I've rationalized in my brain and said, well, I really don't, I really don't believe that's important, so I won't do it. That's honesty, and if you're honest, you'll feel the same way, right? We have to convince ourselves to believe some of the commands that he gives. If we don't believe it, we won't obey it. And they didn't go because they didn't believe. You fast forward 30 years, they still didn't believe. If you look at passages like Matthew 12, it says in verse 38, Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. We don't believe. Give us some proof. He answered to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, you can leave that up if you want to, Mark. Think about that last little statement there. What does that mean? He says, I'm not giving you anything other than the prophet Jonah. What, what does that mean? We can look at that two ways, right? One, you could look at it from a very practical standpoint. Jonah did not go to Nineveh and do miracles. What did Jonah do? Jonah went to Nineveh and said, you've displeased God, repent and turn from your sins. And Nineveh, evil, wicked city, whose gates were stacked high with the skulls of their enemies, repented and turned from their sins. And Jesus is saying to them, Jonah didn't go to Nineveh and do signs and wonders, and that pagan, sinful city turned and repented I, you shouldn't need signs and wonders and miracles. I'm calling you to repentance. Repent. You could look at it that way. You could also look at it in this way, the idea that Jonah came out of the belly of that fish on the third day the same way that Jesus came out of the tomb on the third day. You don't need signs and wonders and miracles. I'm going to die for the sins of the world, and I'm going to be raised in your life and come out of that tomb and yet these same guys following that resurrection would still not believe that he was the Messiah. Instead, they would make up lies to cover it up. Look at this one. This one's even more telling. What about this in John 6? This is the day after Jesus has fed the 5,000. And they said to him, what must we do to be doing the works of God? And Jesus answered them, the religious leaders, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. So they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers, they ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Well, Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. They said to him, sir, Give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. 
Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, but whoever believes in me, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, yet you don't believe. It's tragic. It's tragic to know that we can become so satisfied that we don't obey. That we have the same level of inaction that these religious leaders had. You see, the thing about it is, is that oftentimes I will have people that will come to me and they will say, David, you know, I, I, just, I just am praying and I, you know, I just don't feel like God's showing me what his will is. I just don't, I just don't know what his will is. Sometimes I've, I've been confused about what to do when it comes to, you know, God's will and moving forward and direction for my life and all that. But, you know, sometimes it's not so much that we don't know what God wants us to do. It's that we know exactly what he wants us to do, and we just don't do it. We don't want to do it. We try to figure out loopholes about how we cannot do it. We try to weasel around it and say, well, so-and-so doesn't do it, so if they don't do it, I must be good because, I mean, I'm not, you know, if they don't do it, I'm good. It's not that we don't know what to do. It's the inaction because we get satisfied and we're fine just to sit in the middle of the road and stay where we are. We fail to put those principles into practice every day. If you be satisfied, if you're satisfied, it will lead to indifference. And if you're satisfied, it will lead to inaction. But finally, it will lead to ineffectiveness. If you are satisfied, it will lead to ineffectiveness. These are the religious leaders who knew the signs, who were watching for them, and should have been the first one to tell people that they were coming to pass. But they weren't. If you put these religious leaders next to the wise men, their inaction is glaring. But if you set these religious leaders next to the shepherds, their ineffectiveness is glaring. If you go to Luke's gospel, it tells us about the shepherds. We read this this morning in Sunday school. Listen to these verses, Luke 2, starting in verse 15. When the angels went away from the shepherds into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning the child. You hear that? They told everybody about it. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart, and the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The shepherds published the news of Jesus' birth. Not the religious leaders, the shepherds. They leave the manger telling everyone that they see about what they've heard, about what the angels have told them, about how the Messiah has been born. And people didn't know what to make of it. They wondered, but the shepherds were praising and glorifying God from the manger all the way back to the field. And I have a sneaking suspicion that once they got back to the field, they continued talking about it. And I bet you that later in their life, in the days to come, I bet they continued to tell you, tell them about the time that angel showed up. We do the same thing, right? I bet they recounted that story on multiple occasions. They were publishing the, the news of Jesus birth, and the religious leaders were over there in Herod's palace, silent. One of the most sad and tragic things to me is the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. When you read through that and you see how God's desire was for them to be a light to the nations. The nation of Israel was supposed to be an example they were supposed to be, just in their relationship with God, it was supposed to be a message to every other nation around them, right? But they didn't do a good job. They were not a good light to the nations. They kept wandering off into idolatry. They kept not listening to the word of the Lord. They would do things that were, that were unholy and unright. And everyone would see that, right? And Jesus comes as the servant who would be the true light of the world. Jesus would come and fulfill the mission that the nation of Israel could not. 
And that's the one we should be pointing to. The nation of Israel couldn't save anybody. The law couldn't save anybody. Coming to church can't save anybody. And Center Grove Baptist Church can't save anybody. We should not. Listen, if you want to tell people where you go to church and you want to be excited about the people you go to church with, I think that's wonderful. But none of those things bring salvation. When we have Christmas, we can tell people about the great Christmas music we've heard. We can tell them about all the hot spots to see the best lights, right? We can tell them about what we got for Christmas and what cool gadget we got and how it does what and how whatever. But if we're not telling them about Jesus... None of those other things are effective when it comes to the salvation of souls. And we'll talk about a lot of things, but we won't talk about him. And as it turns out, if you fast forward 30 years, the religious leaders, they, it wasn't that they just didn't share about Jesus. They actively, seemingly preached a false message let me show you what I mean. In Matthew 23, there's this whole list of, of, of woes where Jesus is essentially telling the Pharisees all the things that they're doing wrong. He goes through this whole list. You're wrong at this point. You're wrong at this point. Listen to what he says in verse 15. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you travel across sea and land to make a single proselyte. You're going to, to convert somebody. And when he becomes a proselyte, you make him twice as much a child of hell that you are. If the gospel that we preach is, get your act together, get your life in order, get a good stable job, provide for your family, and live a good moral life, that ain't the gospel. And we make someone a disciple of a false gospel. If we say that the gospel is coming into this building and getting your emotions riled up and getting excited and whooping and screaming like you're at the ball game or like you're on a roller coaster and it becomes a gospel of emotion, that ain't the gospel. And if we're pointing people in that direction, we are ineffective. If we live our life outside of this building with a humanistic, secular worldview and that's all that they see from us and they say, that's a Christian and that's what they believe. We have been ineffective in sharing the gospel because we don't point them to Jesus, we point them to something else. And it's a danger. It's a real danger. Because none of those things save one name under heaven given among men by which we are saved. The way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. No one comes to the Father but through him. And we can promote and we can push lots of things, but if we're not calling people to repent and turn from their sins and trust in what Jesus has done for them on the cross, if that's not what we're sharing, the message we're sharing is ineffective and it doesn't work. These paths that we can lead them down are dangerous and we don't want to take them down an ineffective road. If we get satisfied, if we just get, if we think we know the Christmas story, if we say, oh yeah, David heard that, oh yeah, David heard that, then we fail to miss, we will miss the wonder of Jesus being born. We'll fail to see the wonder of it all that he lived. 33 and a half years, a sinless life to die for me and you on the cross and to save us from our sins. When I was studying this idea of being satisfied, there was a verse that kept coming to my mind that was not part of our text. It's found in the Beatitudes. It's in Matthew 5. Look, listen to this verse. You know this. You know this. It's from the Beatitudes. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For they shall be satisfied. They shall be filled. And as I thought about that verse for just a minute, I, I, thought, I thought about some things that are, that are there. I thought about just a minute that you know, we, we're to hunger and thirst for righteousness, right? 
if you and I are going to have righteousness, we only have it from one place. Because we're not righteous. We could try to trade it back and forth. We could try to muster it up on our own. But you and I are not righteous. The Bible tells me that all of us are sinners. We've all, like sheep, gone astray. There's not one of us that are righteous. Not even one of us. And so if we are going to have righteousness, it will only come from Him. So if I have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness, it's not the righteousness that I have a hunger and thirst for. It's Him who is righteous. It's this having a desire, a hunger, and a thirst for Him. And you see, that passage sounds contradictory, right? Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be satisfied. Well, if you're hungry and thirsty, that's not satisfied. Those are two different things. When it gets hot in the summertime and I work outside, say like all on a Saturday and I'm doing stuff outside, I'm going to tell you I've got a routine. I'll go out and I'll work. Then I'll get hot and sweaty and thirsty. I'll come in, I'll get me some water. Let me tell you what else I like. I like applesauce that comes out of the refrigerator. It's so cold and refreshing. Amy makes fun of me. Them boys have pouches. I'll suck one pouches and Amy will make fun of me. But it's good, and it? It's like a, it's a shot of something good when you're outside working like that. I also like them little cuties. You know, them little, you know little cuties? A little, I don't know if they're orange or something. You know, orange. I'll, I'll eat those things. I think one, one, one day, well, not long ago, I ate six of them. I'd come in. I'd get, I'd eat, I, I had a whole pile of, of, of pills, you know. But then I go back out and then I work. And then after a little while, guess what happens? Come on back. Give me a drink of water. Tear open another one of the cuties. It's good. See, in a world that is parched and dry, a world that is empty and desolate, we got to keep going to him. We got to keep going to him. Because he's the only source of righteousness. He's the only source of satisfaction. And, and the thing about it is, is that because he's the source of my satisfaction, I can't get far from him. He's got to keep me on a short leash. Because I'm on wonder out there somewhere. He's got to draw me back. Because if, if there's going to be anything righteous in my life, if I desire to live a life of righteousness and holiness, a life that he's called me to, I'm incapable of doing that apart from him. And I got to keep coming back over and over again. Listen, if you're here today and you don't know him as Lord and Savior, if your life is a perpetual desert, if it's this idea of, of constant spiritual dryness, if, if it's not right, if you're empty and need to be filled, let me tell you something. I'm pointing you to Jesus and I'm saying he satisfies but if you're a believer in Jesus Christ and you've let the leash get too long, you'll not be satisfied unless you're constantly coming back to him. And this repeated action over and over again does not allow us to sit out there somewhere far from him and get satisfied and think we know it all and say, I've heard all that before, give me something else. It doesn't have to be new, but it needs to be true. And these words are true and good, and we should not stray far from them. Lord, we love you. And today I pray for the one that's here that needs to repent and turn to you. Lord, I pray for the one that has never experienced life in you and and. and Right now, that they don't know what they're feeling, but they know that something's not right between you and them. Lord, you may be speaking very clearly to them about how, how they need you. Lord, I pray that if they hear your voice, that they would respond right now. Come and take me by the hand, and Lord, I pray that, that you would meet them there, that you would, you would take your word and, and open their eyes to the truth that's there. And Lord, I pray that this morning you would gloriously save someone. That they would find their satisfaction in you. Lord, I pray for those that are here this morning that are satisfied in their walk with you. 
Lord, I pray that you would make us uncomfortable. I pray that you would help us to get out of our comfort zone and go to the place that you are leading us. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't just look at your word, that we wouldn't look at the Christmas story, that we wouldn't look at the gospel and just say, yep, heard that. What else? That we wouldn't dismiss it, but that we would hang on every one of your words. That we would run to you, having a hunger and a thirst for righteousness. Lord, we do not want to fall into the trap that these religious leaders fell into. And we certainly do not want to continue down the path and devolve to the level where these guys were when Jesus was teaching and and doing miracles. But Lord, we know it's a danger. And so Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes to see where we're not right with you this morning, that we would repent and turn to you. It's in your name that we pray, Lord. Amen.